Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Carrie Burke, your moderator for today's webinar. AppSec Fast and Slow, your DevSecOps CI CD pipeline isn't an SSA program. You may send in questions at any time during the presentation via the chat feature. We will collect these and address them at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce Dan Cornell, a globally recognized application security expert who holds over 15 years of experience architecting, developing, and securing web-based software systems. As Chief Technology Officer and Principal at Denim Group, he leads the technology team to help Fortune 500 companies and government organizations integrate security throughout the development process. Hello, can everybody hear me? Fantastic. Well, great. Thanks to everybody who uh, tuned in today. Really appreciate that. I'm uh, Dan Cornell. I'm the CTO of Denim Group, coming at you live from Denim Group headquarters in San Antonio, Texas. I was supposed to be the only human in the building today uh, until a couple of minutes ago. We got a, the doorbell rang. There's a guy at the door from uh, alleging to be from a company that does some IT support stuff for us. I said, uh, what are you here for? He's like, well, I'm with this IT support company. I'm like, well, how do I know that? He said, well, I've got this shirt that says I'm from this company. And I was like, well, I've got a shirt that says I'm a Navy SEAL, but that's not true. We got our red team guys got a closet full of shirts in here that uh, you know, let them look like all sorts of people. You know, who do you want to be for your next stop? You want to be the UPS guy? You want to be Batman? Uh, in any case, we called and checked them out. So it's myself and one other human here in the building here today. I uh, hope everybody is doing well. And today we're going to be talking about uh, AppSec or Software Security Assurance Programs. Uh, we're going to be talking about the things that the type of security things people are doing in Dev, SecOps, CI, CD pipelines. Uh, and some misconceptions that we've seen from, uh, you know, from certain organizations that we've talked to, some challenges that we've seen uh, being a little narrowly focused on what can be done in CI CD pipelines at the expense of the broader picture of what you need to be doing programmatically. Uh, that's just a little bit of background about uh, Denim Group and agenda wise. So uh, we will start off talking about what the cool kids are doing and some of the experience that I've had over the years, uh, you know, seeing just really incredible stuff that organizations are doing, making certain things go fast. Uh, then we're going to talk about SSA programs, you know, taking a step back, what does a full software security assurance program look like? Uh, and what are the yardsticks you can use to judge your program as a whole? Uh, then I'll be looking at definitions for fast and slow, you know, specifically for the context of this webinar. Uh, what do we mean by fast? What do we mean by slow? Uh, and, uh, and, and how, how should we think about those? Uh, then I'm going to walk through OWASP, the OWASP Software Assurance Maturity Model, or OWASP SAM, the various activities in OWASP SAM, and look at the ones that it is reasonable to uh, incorporate into CI/CD pipelines, uh, ones where you might not necessarily put them in a CI/CD pipeline, but you use automation to make them go faster, uh, as well as things that just, uh, you know, where, where, again, you may have some tool support, but there's a lot of manual work involved. Uh, and that's just the unfortunate thing about the application and software security space is for all the great advances in automation, for all the great things that organizations are doing, there's still really critical functions that, uh, you know, that can't be automated. I'll wrap this up with some conclusions, and then, as Carrie said, we'll have time to take questions at the end. So first, talk about the cool kids moving fast, right? Uh, and, and especially when we talk to organizations that are really focused on moving fast, the, what that often means is stuff that they put in their DevOps pipelines. And I remember going to DevOps Days Austin a number of years ago, uh, you know, presentations from folks from Etsy, folks from Netflix, like here's the awesome stuff that we're doing in our pipeline to find problems early, right? We've shifted left. Uh, this is in the earlier days of people talking about shifting. Like we've shifted all this stuff left and look at all these security checks that we've put at the front of the pipeline so that we get that feedback early on and we can address these things before they you know, pile up as technical debt before they get pushed into production. Uh, but in asking some questions of those folks like, hey, I see the type of testing you're doing, but how are you testing for authentication or authorization issues? How are you checking to make sure that you don't have these uh, direct object references and things like that? Uh, you know, the speakers didn't have a great answer. And so the while the high speed CI CD testing stuff is really cool uh, and can provide a lot of value to organizations from a scalability standpoint, from an ability to push parts of their program out to the edges of the organization out to the dev teams. Uh, it's important not to become fixated on that as a goal in and of itself, but understand how security testing in a CI/CD pipeline fits into an overall program. 
And so, uh, again, a lot, a lot of focus on the pipeline, right? We want to put all these checks in the pipeline and, you know, application infrastructure, cloud, automation is king, right? And one, one organization we were talking to, they're like, yeah, we would push this DevOps like all the way back to our mainframe groups. And I said, well, that, that may be a bridge too far. That may not be where I would prioritize uh, making sure that you uh, can do multiple deploys on your mainframe per day because I don't know if that's, is, is that the biggest problem that you all are facing or do you need to maybe look in some other areas as well? Uh, you know, this has also been a big focus if you look at presentations from organizations like OWASP, uh, you know, their events, the trainings they're offering, things like that. A lot of focus on testing in the pipeline, which, which is great. And to be fair, there's also a lot of discussion about threat modeling and other topics, but for, for at least the last couple of years, uh, that has really uh, you know, taken center stage in a lot of ways in a lot of the discussions that I've seen in groups such as, uh, such as OWASP. Um, you know, but what it's important also to understand like what doesn't fit into a pipeline. There's a lot of things that don't fit into a pipeline. And, and so in certain organizations, we've seen a little bit of what I would characterize as DevSecOps fundamentalism, uh, where, again, all this focus on shifting left, when, you know, shift left, shift left, shift left. It's like, all right, but there's basic blocking and tackling stuff that you're never going to be able to put in a pipeline that arguably at this point is more critical and more important for your, uh, for your organization. So it's important to understand that your pipeline isn't your program as a whole. So when we talk about software security assurance programs, uh, I like to think of this, uh, you're taking a step back and like asking, what is your why? Uh, hopefully a lot of people are familiar with uh, Simon Sinek's TED Talk. Uh, if you've seen this before, this gets bandied about a lot. If you've seen it before, please, you're more than, uh, you're more than justified in rolling your eyes a little bit. Um, you know, but if you haven't looked at this before, I think it's a really valuable thing to uh, I think it's a really valuable thing to look at. Now, just because something's been maybe a little overused doesn't mean that it's, that it's wrong or that it doesn't have value. Uh, but what his talk goes through is looking at uh, how the why understanding your why is more important than understanding or you know, or, or should drive what the you know how. Uh, and then the how should drive the what or the specific activities that you under uh, that, that you under, uh, undertake. You know, if you if you're in an organization you know, and you're starting up or looking to optimize your SSA program, uh, if you're a paper manufacturing company, uh, you probably have a different answer to what your why is than a top five bank holding company. Right, uh, different threat landscape, different uh, stakes, uh, different regulatory environment, and so you're going to have a lot different answers to question, a lot different priorities, a lot different resources available, uh, and it's important to understand that at the outset. And so, you know, is your why, you know, hey, we need to, you know, keep certain regulators off our back, and we need to, uh, you know, avoid catastrophic problems with our applications, and so we're going to invest only up to that level, uh, or again, is your brand uh, intimately tied up with the security of your application? is protection of customer data. Uh, obviously, it's important. Any organization is super critical for certain organizations, maybe less important to others. So it's important to understand your why, because that's going to drive decisions. Uh, that's your reason for running the program. Uh, the how is going to be the activities that you'll undertake um, as we look through these SSA templates. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about, uh, you know, what, you know, what the, the how uh, activities represent. And then the what or this is the specific implementation of those activities. And, and most of the stuff that you try to stick in a CICD automated testing pipeline falls under that category of the what. And so it's important first to take a step back to understand like what is the mission of the program? Okay, great. What, uh, what are the activities uh, or you know, how are we going to ad address these issues? What different techniques then are we going to use specifically to do that? Uh, so what is the SSA program? Uh, you have to have uh, an acronym. Uh, you know, we, we use at Denim Group, we use SSA or Software Security Assurance. Uh, if you look at the vSIM stuff that we'll talk about here in a minute, uh, I think they use SSI or Software Security Initiative. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, in the, in the security space, it's important to have uh, an, an, an acronym. If you don't have an acronym, uh, yeah, that's, uh, it's, a, it's a bad sign. Let's start with the acronym, you know, then go to the Y. Uh, and so it's a set of practices and activities that you're going to use to reliably create, maintain, and deploy secure software. That's really how we look at it. And, and so what is this program of separate activities that are you know, hopefully complementary that are going to lead to you producing software at a level of security uh, that is appropriate for your organization, for your risk program profile, uh, for the why that you have for your program? Um, you know, uh, we do an annual pen test for PCI, I, I suppose could be your, your SSA program. I would argue that it's not probably going to be a super effective one. Uh, and, uh, you know, also on the, on the flip side of that is here's all the security checks we managed to stuff into, uh, our 
our CI CD pipeline, it's also, you know, not really a program, uh, you know, and, and so the danger again is getting too focused on the specific what of security testing and CI CD uh, at the expense of other activities uh, that are potentially even more important. And so I want to be clear, the point of the webinar isn't to badmouth this concept of shifting left, uh, you know, but it is to combat uh, an unhealthy focus that we've seen in certain organizations that we interact with that are very laser focused, uh, almost myopically focused on testing and CI/CD pipelines at the expense of other activities that are you know, arguably, are arguably going to be more impactful if undertaken. So shifting left isn't bad. Uh, it just isn't everything. Uh, so we'll look at two different, or there's two major maturity models in the application and software security space uh, that kind of provide in insight into the landscape of what different organizations are doing. What are all the various activities that can and do go into SSA programs? And we're going to look at the OWASP, SAM, uh, and vSIM. Uh, OWASP SAM was originally open SAM, uh, created by Praveer Chandra. Uh, you know, it's fantastic. It's something that we've used at Denver for a long time. Um, the OWASP SAM is an evolution or a fork of that uh, that has evolved. Um, and it consists of five business functions. There's three security practices for each, uh, two streams for each one. Uh, and this is really uh, you know, kind of described based on observations of the world this is what, uh, you know, this is, you know, in Prevere's experience, the people that collaborated on that, you know, the, the various uh, contributors from OWASP, uh, of, of which were included. Uh, here's what we've seen in the world in these various organizations, and let's try to make sense of, 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 of that. Uh, and this is what the model looks like, uh, you know, with these uh, various business practices uh, and the specific activities underneath, and we'll spend some time drilling through these. Uh, there's also BSIM out there, uh, originally created by the folks at Sigital, now Synopsys, uh, and they had a little bit of a different methodology. They uh, had a little bit more science going into it where they collected data from a number of participating organizations and used that to drive the, uh, the activity selection. Um, and so, the, you know, and, and as we'll see, they end up in similar places, um, but again, you know, BSIM also uh, you know, at least initially started from working with really large organizations that had very sophisticated uh, you know, uh, SSA programs or SSI, I think, in the terminology they use, uh, since then have incorporated additional folks, uh, you know, kind of you know, farther down the, the, the totem pole. Uh, but four different domains, three practices for each, a total of 119 activities that roll up underneath those. Uh, and that is what, uh, that is, you know, basically structurally what the BSIM looks like. Uh, for the purposes of uh, today, um, we're going to use OpenSAM. Uh, it's a little more prescriptive uh, and less vendor centric, although there are a number of organizations, uh, a number of different firms that contribute to the BSIM, um, you know, that, that bring data from their clients and whatnot to BSIM. Um, but, uh, you know, it's still, I think, perceived as being a uh, uh, pretty synopsis uh, centric, uh, but you know, if, if your organization participates in BSIM, if that's the maturity model that you're using, um, I, you're presumably a clever enough person to be able to adapt uh, what we talk about here to a BSIM model. It should, should be really, really straightforward. Um, one thing I do want to take a step back and say, if you're just starting out with your program, starting out with, uh, with, with an OWASP SAM or a BSIM, we found that to be less than ideal. Uh, the you know, OWASP SAM, BSIM, those can be used as yardsticks of what are we doing in our organization and how do we stack up uh, against others? Uh, you know, against others in the industry. Uh, if you're just starting out and you don't have anything, uh, assessing your program using either tool is uh, less than ideal, or I would even I would even say useless, um, because if, if if you're not doing anything, being told you're not doing anything is not super helpful. Uh, it's like if you're doing a CrossFit workout, there's the concept of like a no rep if you don't meet the movement standard. Uh, it, it, so people are counting. You just get like, you know, if, if you're like, well, how are you doing this? How are you doing this? How are you doing this? What's well, zero, 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 zero? That's not a super helpful model. Um, if you are just getting started, no, number one, thanks for being on this webinar, which I you know, consider to be uh, you know, to talk about some more advanced stuff um, that I think will still be useful for folks. Um, but what we found is an on-ramp is, uh, you know, again, figure out a little bit about your why. Why are we looking to start a program? Let's do some testing of some key apps and run vulnerabilities through to resolution uh, and use the uh, lessons learned from that to proceed from there. That's when you can start to see, well, hey, let's now take a look at a SAM or a BSIM and use that as a yardstick. Um, and so again, if, if, if that's the status that you're at where you are just starting out with a program, again, please feel free to hit us up, let us know in the, in the comments. And uh, uh, you know, we'll be happy to, to guide you through that process. So 
what do we mean when we talk about fast and slow, at least in the context of this webinar? And this is something that I stole from uh, the book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Um, and uh, you know, he, he looks at, uh, you know, he calls them, uh, you know, he, the mind has two systems, system one, system two. System one is fast. Uh, it is the instinctive response that you have and reacts uh, emotionally to situations uh, versus system uh, two, which is slow. It's the deliberative thinking and logical thinking. <clears throat> um, and one of the things that we'll, that we'll talk about, especially with regard to like false positives and things like that, a, a, a challenge looking at things you can do fast versus things that you can do slow, a, a challenge or a success factor for organizations is uh, you want to minimize the you know, so-called emotional uh, or, the, uh, or the distracting parts of uh, uh, decision points that might come through that you're trying to make fast in these CICD pipelines. Uh, and so really the question is, how can we provide high signal, low noise information for decision makers um, in the cases of fast? <clears throat> uh, you know, the book obviously goes far deeper into this uh, analogy. And you know, as, as with all analogies, it starts to fall off the rails. Uh, or my, you know, my use of the analogy uh, you know, starts to fall off the rails. Uh, but I think it, it, it's a useful model to at least start out thinking, what are the things that we can do really fast? What are the things that we have to do slow? And how do we get the most out of those? And how do or we prioritize appropriately between those? Uh, speaking of system one and system two, uh, this is just an aside. What a horrible name. Why couldn't they call it like fast thinking and slow thinking? I don't know. Uh, that's almost, that's nearly as bad as type one and type two errors. Uh, for folks that uh, are uh, familiar with type one and type two errors, uh, again, type one error is when you <laughs> make the wrong conclusion. You essentially have a false positive versus a false negative. Uh, false positive and false negative are such descriptive terms. I don't know why you would uh, like in, in lieu of using those terms, you would, you would call them type one and type two errors. So fortunately, most folks in our industry uh, who aren't total maniacs, uh, you know, tend to use false positives and false negatives, which uh, again, are far more descriptive. Uh, as on another side, uh, there's a great book by Michael Lewis, uh, not related to app security really at all, uh, but called The Undoing Project that looks at the research and the collaboration between uh, Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky, um, and uh, again, has nothing to do with AppSec, but is uh, certainly uh, a very, I found it to be a very interesting read. Uh, so you're welcome for your uh, Denim Book of the Month Club selection. Uh, so let's look at fast and slow. And in a culture like DevSecOps or DevOps that is so focused on fast, especially in these organizations that are undergoing so-called digital transformation initiatives, uh, where it's all about being agile, being fast, being responsive, uh, it's, I think, important to take a step back again and to understand what is still critical but has to go slow, where it's not realistic to expect things to go fast. Um, <clears throat> again, there's uh, often too much focus on the new and the shiny, uh, which it, I'll admit is fun. Uh, you know, I'm a builder, not a maintainer. I'm, I'm uh, you know, taken by the shiny uh, my, myself, just personality and work style wise, uh, and have to and have to actively work against that. And so, you know, what, when, when I talk about fast, what do we mean by fast? And uh, again, I'll have a bunch of links to other resources for folks here. We can go and look uh, a little bit deeper at some of the concepts that we're talking about. Um, but I've got a blog post that I put up that looks at, you know, what is the, you know, if power and responsibility, what security roles in the DevOps pipeline? Because DevOps pipelines exist to support the development and the DevOps teams, right? Like the point is to produce software uh, and, you know, Again, it is a little bit of a next step to say we want to produce secure software. And so if you look at incorporating security testing into DevOps pipelines, what do you need to focus on in order to make sure that you don't get kicked out of that pipeline or that your participation in that pipeline doesn't uh, create unhealthy dynamics or unhelpful dynamics? And what we've seen is if you want to be DevSecOps fast for security, your security results have to be available quickly they have to be very high value, uh, and you have to have low or no false positives. Uh, so if any, for any of the psychopaths who may be listening, that's no type one uh, errors. Uh, and so, you know, why is this? Why do you need to be available quickly? You have a limited time budget. Um, you know, 
you know, how much time is the development team willing to allocate specifically to security testing? Uh, and anecdotally, uh, you know, what we started to hear a couple of years ago is like eight to 12 minutes. Uh, now, you know, with I asked where you're laying your I asked testing potentially with your like, uh, you know, integration tests and things like that, using that to drive traffic, uh, you may be able to sneak in some additional time. Uh, but, but the point is you're, you're not going to be able to get some sort of a big, like, hey, bundle all this stuff up and ship it over to a server for a bunch of testing and we'll get you an answer 12 hours later. Well, what we think the security of this build is, at least not for the, the you know, high speed, uh, you know, multiple ter per day builds that you have. So you get a limited time budget. And also developers have to care. You have to be providing them with results where they can see those and say like, oh, I'm glad that you stepped in and brought my attention to this. Uh, it is, it, I find it to be important enough for me to go and fix this now uh, so that I can get this uh, particular check-in through the process or whatever it might be. Uh, yeah, like, thank you very much for bringing this to my attention, not why are you bothering me with this stuff? And finally, and this is in a lot of ways the most critical in certain cases, the hardest, you can't waste the developer's time. If you are throwing up a lot of chaff in the form of false positives, that is a fantastic way to get kicked out of pipelines. Um, and, and, and that's a real challenge just because all of the automated tools are going to have false positives. And so we're going to talk about the need to constrain the rule sets, uh, constrain the checks that you have, uh, you know, both to make sure that you're providing developers only with stuff that they care about, but also to make sure that you're minimizing to the greatest degree possible false positives. Um, and the trade-off from that is because you have slimmed down what the tools are looking for there's probably stuff that you're missing uh, and that's why the security testing that you put into your CI CD pipeline you should not consider to be comprehensive there's probably additional testing activities that you need to undertake uh, in order to uh, you know in order to feel like you have a sufficiently comprehensive view of the security of the software uh, so now we'll take a walkthrough of the OWASP SAM, the various activities um, and uh, business functions and activities uh, and talk about like which of those can you expect to make fast, uh, which you know, would you maybe not put in a pipeline, but where can you take advantage of some automation uh, and where are you you're just realistically uh, you're signed up for a little bit of a slog. Starting with governance, looking at strategy and metrics, policy and compliance, education and guidance. And so strategy and metrics, you can't automate your strategy, right? Much like you can't automate your why, uh, you know, you need to understand what is our strategy? <clears throat> uh, what, what, what are we trying to do here with this program, right? Which levers are we trying to push on first? Uh, and from a metric standpoint, how are we going to measure the success that we have undertaken? And so strategy is a, is a slow undertaking. Now, the good news is you can use your CI CD pipelines and the testing tools associated with that uh, as a, uh, you know, as, as sensors uh, out in your organization pulling data in. And so that can help to feed your metrics. And so this is your metric collection, uh, especially via CI CD, that can be kind of fast. It's not going to be your entire program coming from your CI CD pipelines. Um, but there are uh, some great benefits that you get from using collecting data from your CI CD pipelines and using that to feed into your overall metrics program. Uh, and metrics in general, uh, this is a very automatable thing. Uh, and so here's some links, we won't go deep into these, uh, but here's some links to some blog posts, um, you know, looking at using our ThreadFix platform and metrics associated with that. And how do you collect data and then how do you use that data to drive decision making in your program? But again, uh, you know, metrics, if you're using an appropriate platform, collecting these metrics, using those to drive decisions uh, should be something that where you can take advantage of a lot of automation uh, and use that data to help you drive better decision making to allocate scarce resources better. Um, and that's, again, just a challenge with security in general, application security, I think in particular, uh, is you want to drive better decision making uh, and your metrics can help you do that. Uh, so let's look at policy and compliance, right? You, you, you can't realistically automate the creation of your policies, right? That's going to be input from various, uh, you know, various parts of your organization. Uh, you know, you may have aspects of your program that are controls based. You may have, uh, you know, you know I believe more ideally aspects of your program that are risk-based, um, but you're going to have to make a determination. What are the policies that we have? That's also going to be driven by uh, you know, compliance regimes that you sit under, uh, regulators and, and things of that nature. And so you know, creation of your policies is going to be slow. You can use CI CD to automate some policy checks, right? Uh, so, and as we'll go into greater detail later on, um, you know, there are, checks that you can put into CI CD pipelines where you can potentially fail to build. Uh, if you'll remember back when we talked about that great power and great responsibility blog post, there are limitations in the checks that you're going to have. And so 
I, I view CICD as helping to inform uh, compliance decisions, uh, but, but not providing the definitive answer. And so, so again, from a, from a compliance standpoint, if you've got this data collection uh, in a platform, uh, you, know, you can pull data in from CICD, you can help to make some pass or fail decisions based on that, uh, but that's a helper, that is a support function. Uh, you can use, you know, again, automation down the line, but that incorporates more broad data sources that have potentially slower testing activities incorporated into that, manual testing activities incorporated into that. And that's what's ultimately probably going to be required for uh, you know, making you know, final or definitive decisions. Uh, you know, and so, but again, you know, certain compliance checks, uh, you can at least find some of the bozo stuff and so you can make some of that stuff fast. Uh, and again, uh, this is just a, a view you know, that you can drill into. Uh, you know, the slides will be available uh, looking at like, how do I configure CICD pass fail policies uh, in ThreadFix? What are the capabilities there? What testing are, are we going to do synchronous where we can make a decision based on that? What testing what might we do that is asynchronous where we're going to have to go out of band to collect the results of that and potentially you know, take some other remediation activity based on it? Uh, how do I make a decision and how do we do the reporting on that? Uh, so we've got resources available uh, that you can take a look at. Uh, there's also something that may be of uh, specific interest to folks in the DOD or IC space. Uh, if your organization deals with the requirement to <clears throat> get to an authority to operate or an ATO, uh, we've been doing a bunch of work with organizations in that space on how do we, how do we provide continuous ATO uh, for the uh, you know, for the controls checks that you need, uh, like how do we automate as many of those as realistically possible uh, and do that uh, in a way that lets you be much more agile um, and much more responsive in the way that you can provide software releases. And so we see this a lot now in the DOD space, folks working toward these software factories. Uh, how do we get software builds approved more quickly rather than taking you know, months or weeks that we can turn those around much more quickly? Uh, this resource may be of particular interest to organizations that have that requirement to meet these, uh, to, to get this authority to operate or comparable um, uh, authorizations. Um, you know, take a look at that. Now let's look at education and guidance. Uh, Instructor-led training is the slowest of slow, which doesn't mean it's bad. That's a great way if you really want to drive deeper knowledge uh, for folks. Uh, there's nothing like instructor-led training. Uh, it's not necessarily realistic that everybody in your organization is getting instructor-led training, but if you have security champions, if you've got certain uh, you know, security critical folks, uh, instructor-led training, the ability to interact, to have that back and forth with the instructor uh, is really, really valuable and can help to drive a lot deeper knowledge more quickly. Uh, you know, monolithic e-learning, uh, also slow, but great for scaling a training program. And what we've started to see recently is, a, uh, is, is these much more like targeted and uh, you know, kind of just snippets of learning to say, oh, hey, here's SQL injection in this particular environment. Here's cross-site scripting with this particular framework. Um, you know, that's not something that's getting delivered via CI/CD pipeline, but with the quick feedback loop that you're getting from CI/CD pipelines, that can help you to drive um, the, the consumption of this e-learning very much closer to the point where the, a, a problem was injected. Um, and so this is really interesting. There's some vendors out there doing great stuff, uh, really, really interesting stuff. And I like to see that, um, I, I like to see that evolution of the e-learning space. Uh, also, when we look at education and guidance, security champions are a really common approach that we're seeing in a lot of organizations. I'll talk more about that in just a second. Uh, and one of the most common responsibilities that we see for security champions in organizations is, you know, they're, they're helping to roll out for the different development teams. Here's how we're going to roll out testing activities in the context of your CI CD pipelines, right? So security champions can be a great approach to making things faster in your organization because they're bringing their security knowledge and their development knowledge together to say, I understand what you're doing in this CI CD pipeline and here's where it's realistic to expect that we can instrument this uh, and get value out of it. Um, again, another reference for folks, uh, we recently did a webinar on security champions. Uh, that's something that talks uh, in, in much more uh, detail or much more deeply about the different approaches we've seen organizations take building out these security champions programs. Um, you know, certainly take a look um, if that's something you're considering for your organization. And also, uh, my colleague John Dixon is doing a, some survey work with a variety of organizations, collecting information about their security champions programs or their plans for their security champions programs. Uh, if you'd like to participate in that, uh, again, hit up the, I, I had a link earlier uh, in the slides, uh, hit up the Denim Group contact form and just uh, put that in the, uh, in, in the information there. And we can get a time scheduled for you to, to uh, have a call with John Dixon to talk about, uh, you know, again, what your, your current 
implementation of your security champions program is or what your plans are for it. Now let's look at design. <clears throat> and design, these aren't really the areas where we're looking for things to go fast. All right, these are the lead up activities where you set the standards that you're going, going to need to verify later. So there's not a lot of fast in here. Right, when you look at threat assessment, security requirements, security architecture, uh, there's not a lot of automation or you know, like you know, the, the, the build pipeline comes later once you've started to build the software. But if you haven't done these lead up activities, how are you going to know what to verify later, right? You can just uh, you know, accept like, hey, I stuffed this tool in my pipeline. I accepted the default configuration, but that's, you know, we haven't found that really to be a recipe for success. You need to, from a design standpoint, to have figured out what is and isn't acceptable. And then you have the tooling where possible confirm that later on. Uh, and, and that's, I think, much better. Uh, you know, that sort of a let's start with the bare bones and build up our verification, we found to be much more successful, especially with like static analysis tools. Don't run all the rules because you're gonna get like insanity back. Instead, figure out, hey, from a design standpoint, what controls do we wanna see in place? What controls uh, can we verify with, uh, you know, with, with static analysis? Uh, okay, well, let's add those in. Um, that's, that's just been a, a more uh, successful strategy that we've seen. From a threat assessment standpoint, again, de determining your general application threat pro profiles for your organization you know, can't be automated. You know, there's certainly heuristics by industry uh, that you can think about. You know, that's something where people have experience, but that's a very slow activity. Threat modeling also requires a lot of manual work. Uh, we've, we've built some auto threat model generation stuff um, that, uh, that we're working with internally that is, that's certainly interesting. I think some of the threat modeling tool folks uh, are also uh, working on that as work uh, as well. I haven't seen a lot of this uh, from an operational standpoint implemented in people's CI CD pipelines. Again, the vendors out there that are providing the tooling support for this, the threat modeler folks, the Erius risk folks, the OWASP th threat dragon project um, are, pr are providing the ability to create these threat models and to add to them incrementally. Uh, that can help in these agile environments where each sprint you can go and say, well, hey, has our threat model shifted at all? Cool, let's add the things or pull the things out that we need to. Uh, but fundamentally threat modeling uh, is, and, and for the foreseeable future, large aspects of that I think are gonna remain uh, pretty slow. From a security requirements standpoint, uh, again, determining, determining what your requirements are is largely manual. Uh, there's some tooling support. We'll talk uh, a little bit later on about some of the things like the SD elements folks do and how that, uh, you know, how, how that kind of dovetails with things that we do in the ThreadFix platform. Uh, you know, they've got an API and whatnot, but again, in a lot of cases, determining a lot of your security requirements, uh, there may be templates and things that speed up the process, but, uh, but the ultimate decisions are going to be manually done. Uh, and validating if these are met is uh, largely manual, and we'll look at this when we talk about the verification, uh, you know, specifically the requirements-driven testing activity uh, in, just a, in just a minute here. Uh, secure architecture, again, like determining your architectural security requirements is a very manual thing to do. Uh, and the validation is also largely manual, but we'll talk about some certain things that you can automate uh, here in just a little bit. Uh, now, if you look at the implementation, this, uh, this, isn't, this doesn't involve the verification, but it sets the stage, uh, especially the secure build and secure deployment uh, activities. Uh, and also, there's certain things you can automate in defect management. But secure build, this is really the crux of what we're discussing today. Uh, and, and an area where you can really go fast, right? How do we make sure that we've got a repeatable build? And once we have a repeatable build, how can we integrate security testing into that build process, right? So how do we take these app security testing tools, static, dynamic, interactive analysis, software composition analysis, uh, and integrate those into, uh, you know, into the build process? And where is it appropriate to do that? What is it appropriate to expect out of that? And I just want to highlight the uh, OWASP Dependency Check Project, a fantastic open source, uh, you know, freely available software composition analysis tool maintained by uh, Jeremy Long. Uh, definitely take a look at that if, uh, you know, if you don't already have a solution in that space. Uh, and again, you know, for folks on this uh, webinar, if you're even considering this, you have to have a repeatable build. Right? If you don't, now please like, log off this webinar, uh, pick up a Jenkins for Dummies book, uh, get your build process automated, uh, and then, and then and pick this back up. Up once you once you're at that starting point, but this assumes that you have a build process that is repeatable, you know, either in uh, you know Jenkins or Bamboo or any of the other uh, you know, orchestration frameworks that are out there. An important concept for this secure build uh, activity 
is one of the things that should come out of it as you get to a level of maturity is at least a software bill of materials. What is all the software, especially the open source components and their versions that we've included in this? And for that, I'd also like to highlight uh, the OWASP dependency track project. Uh, you know, that is a system that helps you to build and maintain those software bill of materials, uh, you know, developed and maintained by Steve Springett, a fantastic uh, you know, flagship level pro project for OWASP. Uh, you know, recommend, uh, very much recommend that. Uh, on the topic of software bills and materials, uh, like I've also been looking, especially in these cloud native applications environment, at the concept of an architectural bill of materials. Um, and so, if, if you're more, if you're interested in that, looking beyond just like an individual node and the software that goes in that, but looking more broadly at the infrastructure assets, the cloud assets that go into these cloud native applications, uh, you know, take a look at the uh, this, this this webinar, the A's, B's, and four C's of, of uh, testing cloud native apps. Uh, spoiler alert: the A in uh, and A, B's, and C's is architectural bill of materials. Uh, so we, that's an area where if you're interested in that topic, uh, we've got some additional information. Secure deployment as an activity, that's an extension of the secure build. So you say, well, first we've automated the building of the software. Now we wanna automate the deployment of the software so that that gets deployed in a consistent and secure and repeatable manner. Uh, so I really see that as being an extension of secure build, uh, but an area where in practice, I think we see organizations have a little bit less maturity, uh, <clears throat> uh, just because again, there's a lot of focus on the build and how do we get this to the servers? Uh, you know, again, a lot of automation available in place, uh, techn technologies like Puppet, Chef, and Terraform, uh, but this is an area where you can, you can very much expect to go fast and get a lot of benefit out of that. Uh, so when we look at defect management, right? And this is a critical thing, uh, that we have seen in our, uh, you know, both in our advisory services practice as well as working with folks on the ThreadFix platform, but the practice of taking vulnerabilities that security teams care about and turning those into software defects that development teams care about, that is a, 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 a that's a critical step for uh, software security assurance programs that want to make progress, right? You have to get this backlog or the security backlog in the hands of the developers and the tool and the tools that they're already using. So you've got to turn vulnerabilities into software defects. The great news is a subset of this can be fast, right? Uh, like with, you know, uh, with, with you know, ThreadFix, we've automated, we, we have the facility available for you to automatically create defects uh, based on different criteria. An important thing to understand is you have to tune the scanners or you're going to run into problems. If you go back to remember what we talked about, uh, results have to be available fast. That doesn't really have a, uh, or very available quickly. That doesn't really have a bearing here. Uh, but it has to be stuff folks care about and you can't have false positives. That's where the tuning comes in. If you're going to auto create defects uh, as part of a CI CD run, you have to have those tools tuned so that you've got high value results and you don't have false positives. Uh, otherwise, you're just sending chaff to the development team and you can pat yourself on the back about like how much cool DevSecOps security testing that you're doing, but you're really just gumming up the works and, and that's not helping. Um, and so in practice, what we see is it takes a while to get to this level because it's usually for an application understanding for the tools that we're using on this application to identify badness. And great. Do we have those tunes so that we're getting the results that we want uh, and, then, and then we're not getting these false positives that are going to cause trouble? And so it's kind of a, you know, we really, we see organizations with a like walk before you run type of approach. Uh, but the good news is as you get these things dialed in, you can't automate defect creation for those. And obviously, that is you know, only for the vulnerabilities you're finding in your CI CD pipelines. And we'll talk more about the testing limitations that we see uh, in some of the verifications discussions. And when we look at uh, this defect creation, you've got your uh, bundling strategies. Uh, like if you're taking vulnerabilities and turning those into defects on a one-to-one -one ratio, uh, that's less than ideal in a lot of cases because uh, you're gonna spend more time administering the defects than you are actually fixing the issues. Uh, and uh, you know, like you're gonna have the QA manager like gunning for you in the parking lot uh, if we still worked in a, in a world where people went to buildings with parking lots uh, that QA managers could find them in. Uh, maybe, that, maybe that makes everybody safer. Uh, but instead, you can look at bundling. You know, uh, very common we see bundling by vulnerability type um, uh, with applications that are a little farther along in the maturity process, maybe severity, just saying like, hey, we got some new results, knock out these newest things that we found. Uh, and again, there, there may be other approaches that make sense depending on your dev team. 
when we look at the metrics and feedback stream of this defect creation, uh, we, we view the scanner and the developer are providing a separation of duties. The scanners find vulnerabilities, right? You turn them over to developers as defects. The developers say, hey, we've fixed them. And then the scanners go in and confirm that. And so the, the developers can't unilaterally say, yeah, we got that boss. That's totally fixed, right? You know, that's, that's a recipe for uh, you know, less, less than good outcomes. You want that separation of duties where you've got one party, you know, again, maybe a pen tester for uh, you know, things that aren't found by vulnerability, aren't found by automation, um, you know, but things that are found by automation, scanner found it, we've confirmed it's not a false positive, great. Hey, developers, work on this until you can make the scanner be quiet. Uh, and that is, that is a standard. <laughs> it's not necessarily the, the only standard, but that is a separation of duties that we see work in a lot of organizations. Uh, and that's one of the things that we work with a lot uh, for, for folks that are using the ThreadFix platform is looking at that mean time to remediation, right? A, a lot of like earlier metrics efforts looked at like vulner, vulnerability density, like how many vulnerabilities per you know, thousand lines of code per kilo lines of code. Like that's easy to calculate, which is a characteristic of a good metric, but it's all, I don't think it's a great metric because it, it like that density. Well, you know, if there's one here and that's never called, that's not an important function. Is that like how do I know that that's different than vulnerabilities over here that where we maybe have fewer of them, but they're in critical code that gets called a lot where they have a greater impact. Um, and uh, you know, especially for agile teams, looking at this CI/CD, if you're trying to go fast, that's a great question. Like how short can you make? vulnerabilities lifespan in your organization. Uh, that is something that, that we found to be valuable. Like when you're, when you're trying to drive agility, like it's a less a question of like, where are you at? And it's more a question of like, how quickly are you getting toward where you want to go? Uh, and so uh, again, <clears throat> you know, metrics and feedback on these defects uh, is something that uh, certainly can be uh, associated with your CI CD pipeline, or at least where you can take advantage of a lot of automation for this calculation. Now we get to verification, and this is really where the questions about fast come in. Uh, yeah, the, implement, the, uh, the implementation provides the setup uh, and the automation framework. Now the question is like, how much of what we want to verify is automatable? Uh, from an architecture assessment standpoint, this is uh, you know, largely has to be done manually uh, and is slow. Uh, although there are some architectural policies you may be able to check automatically, especially when you have like cloud environments, um, you know, you, know, you, can, you can run checks on these cloud environments. Uh, one thing I'll highlight is uh, you know, ThreadFix working with Erius Risk. Um, you can pull data from ThreadFix into Erius Risk, and so you can combine, well, here's our threat model and our vulnerability management that we've done. Um, uh, you know, also, the Scout Suite, you know, again, if you want to check the configuration of cloud environments, it's a really powerful tool uh, for, for you know, checking certain aspects of architectural policies that you might have in place about you know, F3 buckets, uh, identity and access management configuration, and so on. For requirements-driven testing, <clears throat> you, know, you, you wanna do this control verification. A lot of those have to be checked in a manual way, um, you know, depending on, on, on the types of controls that you're looking at. There's certain things that you can, that, where you can uh, look for broken controls via static analysis or via dynamic or fuzz testing. Um, uh, you know, but, but like a, a lot of controls, you know, you know, your policy-based controls, you've gotta you know, validate in a manual way. Um, and for misuse or abuse testing, a fuzzing can be automated. Um, but if you look at like real fuzzing runs, that's probably not something that you're going to put into a CI CD pipeline uh, just because the runtime is going to extend, right? You can fuzz infinitely. You know, dynamic application security testing is, is directed fuzzing. Um, and uh, so there are opportunities to put some dynamic testing into, uh, into pipelines. We'll look at a little bit more. When you get to things like abuse case and business logic testing, that is, uh, that, that is largely manual. Uh, I, I've, I've seen some examples where folks have tried to create like unit tests to look for security bugs that, uh, that, that, that are more abuse case or business logic testing. The problem is those tests, in my experience, tend to be very brittle. They tend to look for very specific scenarios and they might catch a regression in that particular instance, but they're not gonna broadly catch regression cases across the application. Um, and it, they tend to be too application specific and then you have to maintain those test cases over time. And that's, it's just uh, like, as much as I want that to be a thing that works, I just haven't found a lot of great uh, uh, you know, test cases where that works successfully. Uh, even worse, if you're like unit testing for things like SQL injection or cross-site scripting, 
I, like I, that, that again, that those, if you look for coverage of those types of issues, you're, those are typically going to be more effectively handled by your static analysis tool, your dynamic analysis tool, as opposed to handwriting specific unit tests. Again, unless you have some very weird corner cases that, that the tooling can't find that you're worried about recurring. Uh, and so a lot of this is very slow. Again, there's automation that can support this, uh, integration that can support this, um, but a lot of this is a manual process. As I mentioned earlier, the SD Elements folks do the security requirements management. Uh, and, and with the ThreadFix, we also have an integration there. Uh, I'll refer you to a webinar where we talked about this, where uh, SD Elements lets you maintain, like, hey, you know, here's the various characteristics of the application. And from that, it's like, hey, here's a list of controls or security requirements that you've got. Uh, you can combine that with data coming out of ThreadFix to say, here are the different testing activities that we've undertaken. Let's look for the coverage that we see of the testing that's been done versus the security requirements, what does that leave left, uh, left, uh, left behind? And so, um, you know, that uh, w webinar is out there. Uh, encourage folks to take a look. Um, and that's the webinar is actually from a couple years ago. That's probably worth uh, us doing a refresh of this. So now we look at security tests. This is really what the CICD discussion comes down to. And so how, what can you put into a CICD pipeline and how uh, sufficient is that testing going to be? When you look at OWASP SAM for the security testing activities, there's uh, you know, two streams. There's the scalable baseline. This is where a lot of this is focused. And there's the deep understanding where none of that is, unfortunately, none of that is fast. Um, my, my perception is that OWASP has traditionally had a, a, a cultural focus on uh, the need for work beyond automated tools. Uh, I've been involved in OWASP for you know, probably 15 plus years at this point. Uh, they have a culture of tool vendor neutrality, which I think is great, uh, occasionally maybe slightly vendor hostile. Uh, and, and I think it also, again, I think a lot of the uh, early participants in uh, the drove OWASP were consultants, where of course you're talking about uh, manual security testing versus scanner vendors that are talking about uh, like how you can automate uh, you know, the, 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 the wonders of automation. Again, the answer is probably somewhere in the middle, but I do think that if you look at resources from OWASP, like the testing guide and uh, the application security verification standard, they make a very strong case for the need for verification activities beyond what can be uh, automated, uh, which, which again, I think is a very healthy thing to understand. You know, here's tooling and automation. Here are these techniques tremendous value associated with them. They, they give you leverage that you simply can't get with humans. Uh, but there are aspects that, you know, at the current time, you know, unless, you know, until machine learning puts us all out of business, which I'm sure is like around the corner, uh, you know, until that time, there's certain things that only humans are going to be able to do. If we look at the scalable baseline screen stream, there's three levels of maturity. Use an automated tool, Right. The next is employ application specific automation, which means tune this tool to work specifically for that application. Uh, and the third, the highest level of maturity for this stream is to integrate into the build process. And so the very premise of this webinar presupposes that you're focused, that you're looking at that top level of maturity for this particular stream, for this particular activity. Right. And so again, the danger there is if you are the most mature in this particular area, uh, does that mean that you have not paid attention to these other areas? It doesn't mean that you haven't, but it's certainly a uh, you know, potential concern. Uh, so you know, if you're putting testing into CICD pipelines, you did remember to, uh, you to tune your scanner before you put it in the build process, right? Uh, you know, the deep understanding stream, this is all manual, uh, manual tests for high risk com components, uh, penetration testing, even though I've seen a couple of, uh, you know, startups claiming to like automate penetration testing. Sure. Uh, you know, again, doesn't mean there's not tool support or certain things that, uh, that people have figured out, uh, you know, integrating testing into the development process. The tooling here certainly can help uh, focusing efforts on the diffs or new and altered functionality. I'll have some examples of that in a second. Uh, but, but the deep understanding stream, like, you know, that's never something that is going to be uh, materially handled inside of a CICD pipeline, again, without some sort of uh, technological revolution. So when we look in pipelines, well, let's look at static analysis and CICD. You know, and what we see there in practice is a lot of the open source, more like linting type tools that because you have this need for speed, right? It's, we see, you know, fewer uh, runs, uh, or at least not synchronous runs of commercial grade tools um, because, you know, if you're doing this cross method, cross class data and control flow analysis, you know, that just by its very nature takes 
time. <clears throat> you know, uh, and you know, some of the vendors let you do uh, static analysis on diffs. That's you know certainly interesting. Uh, but again, in practice, what we see a lot of the CI/CD integration is these linting tools that look for obvious bad signatures. You know, you kind of clean out the ones that are you know are, are chaff that you don't really care about, um, and that's very good. Again, there are signatures that can be really valuable to find early in the process. And with the, with, even with those, you've got to uh, cut down on the rules so that you shorten run times, but most importantly, limit the false positives so you're not seeing stuff that you don't want to see. Uh, dynamic uh, security testing in CI/CD. Again, I've got uh, I, I've got concerns about runtimes. Um, you know, we have played around with doing very targeted DAST. Uh, again, scaling back to the rule set is one of those things. Also, focusing on changes in the application. Uh, here's a link to a presentation that uh, that I was given for a while, looking at like how can we look at uh, changes in the attack surface for applications and only doing dynamic testing for the new or the changed parts of applications. Uh, I think that's a technique that's got some merit. We've played around with this in certain environments. Uh, I, I think that's an area that deserves uh, more uh, focus and more, uh, more uh, effort to be put behind it. Uh, IaaS testing and CI/CD, great. Um, the important thing there is they typically rely on generated traffic uh, in order to exercise the application so their sensors can flag that. You can potentially use DAST testing to generate that traffic, but as we uh, as we talked about, like full DAST testing may be too too much for this. Um, but you can also use things like integration tests being run through a proxy. Uh, that uh, that can help to seed this uh, to help to seed this as well, and so you may be able to as a, as, as an IAS or if you're looking at your IAS scans, you can piggyback on your integration testing runs, your acceptance testing that you're doing in CI/CD, uh, and secretly extend the security budget by piggybacking off of stuff where they are willing to wait uh, additional time uh, and get additional security insight uh, from that. So this uh, that's uh, that type of analysis I think is really interesting. Uh, also, uh, software composition analysis in CI/CD. That's great. Um, again, uh, when I look at that, you know, there's no reason not to put it in your CI/CD pipeline. But I also look at the uh, trade-off versus the velocity of like how often are new components added to the, this particular piece of software? How frequently are new vulnerabilities found? Uh, do you need to run that 17 times a day? Uh, you know. Maybe, maybe not, uh, you know, maybe like once per sprint is acceptable, but again, uh, you know, from a runtime standpoint, that's uh, something that is possible to integrate. So, you know, it's uh, certainly possible to do it and, and why not as long as trying to get that tuned uh, isn't distracting you from other activities that may be more important. Uh, moving on then to look at the operations. Right, when we look at incident management, uh, you know, that's not really something that happens in a pipeline. This is something that's a server that's running. Uh, you know, again, there's uh, the opportunity to use uh, automation for detection where possible. Uh, there's some automation frameworks available for the response. Uh, I'm sure you can call your local uh, WAF or RAS vendor and they will explain to you how you, they have this like totally solved for you and you don't need to worry about it. Um, but again, <clears throat> incident management is something that uh, you know, is, is not really related to pipelines. Um, one thing I will highlight, uh, and this is an older talk from, uh, from, from John Dixon, uh, but I think it holds up and I think it's still worth discussing. Uh, and what he talked about is the concept of uh, what kind of logging do you, should you be doing in your application from a security standpoint? Uh, and, and really what it comes down to is a lot of developers, when they think of logging, they're thinking of debugging. Right. What is the current state of the application and how is it not what I thought it was going to be so I need to go and fix a bug versus from a security standpoint where you want to know when events happen in the application so that you can correlate those together to look for patterns. Um, again, this is a, an older talk that John gave, but I still think it's really interesting uh, and is worth, uh, is worth looking into. Uh, environment management, uh, the, the, the you know, saying of you know, servers should be cattle, not pets. Again, when we talked about this automated deployment <clears throat> and uh, you know, the environment management, uh, you know, hopefully you have this sorted out. Like with what you did for secure deployment, hopefully you have a lot of this configuration handling figured out. You're using you know, Chef Puppet Terraform in order to set up your environments and you can do checking with automation for parts of this with Scout Suite. Um, you know, patching, finding problems with patching, uh, that can be done very fast. Uh, the actual actual patching tend, you, uh, you often have to be a little more deliberate, especially when looking at swapping out components. Uh, you know, in a perfect world, you could just swap components out with a newer version, it would all work. Uh, in practice, you need to look for regressions in those areas. 
uh, from operational, oops, operational management standpoint, uh, you know, data protection uh, streams, uh, like maybe your, uh, maybe your DLP solution is sorting this out for you. Eh, maybe. <laughs> and then uh, again, from a decommissioning, that is a, that is the ultimate slow process of like looking and figuring out like, what is this server doing? What is this application doing? Is no one using this? Is it safe for us to turn this off? Uh, again, from our, you know, for our purposes of our discussion today, that's the slowest of slow processes. Uh, you don't want to decommission applications uh, willy nilly because that's a, it can be a career limiting uh, maneuver. So what are we looking at here? You know, what goes into a pipeline? Uh, it's easy to do things like linting SAST, uh, DAST if you can target it or keep the rule set down so that it runs fast enough. Uh, I asked if you can piggyback off of meaningful traffic generated and SCA if you want. What doesn't get done inside of a pipeline? You know, full runs of commercial grade SAST typically run too long. Uh, full DAST, same thing for especially for large applications. You know, manual code review for the you know for the classes of vulnerabilities that you simply aren't able to find with automation. The same thing with penetration testing or manual assessment, right? Business logic, authentication, authorization issues, you know, things that are particular to that application. You know, it, it's got to be done manually. It can't be fit into a pipeline. Threat modeling, again, exists largely outside of a pipeline, uh, as well as all the more broad things that you're doing in this program as a whole, developing strategy, developing policy, training your developers, uh, determining your architecture and your security requirements. So shifting left is awesome, uh, fantastic, right? And, and again, there's really cool stuff being done and this is a great way to get like down and dirty with your developers, get you know into their tooling, get them thinking about security. Uh, but that's only one aspect of a far more complicated landscape. Um, and, and really, I think from a testing standpoint, you need to think from a coverage standpoint, the different classes of vulnerabilities that you can encounter, right? Certain detection approaches can find those, you know, static, dynamic, I asked, <clears throat> great. Others, you have to use penetration, you have to use code review. Uh, and again, each of these approaches are gonna have different levels of quality. Uh, for everything else, it's important to take a step back and look at your program as a whole and make sure that you're not over investing in shifting left at the expense of other critical decisions that have to be made. Uh, at this point, I'll open things up for questions. Uh, first question: Will uh, will we be, will, will we be sharing the deck? Yeah, we will be sharing the both the deck, uh, so all the links in there will be uh, clickable, uh, as well as uh, the the video will be available. Uh, you know, Carrie gets those edited down. It usually takes like a day or so or something to get through the uh, you know, get through the export process. Uh, excellent. <clears throat> Other questions that folks might have. Uh, okay, yeah, so the explain the shift left, uh, shifting left terminology, right, and so that is, uh, the concept there is, uh, and I guess this is a, uh, I, I don't know the language, like in, in the English language, uh, and in a lot of languages, although not like Arabic and Hebrew, go right to left, so culturally this is, we're kind of, uh, out of whack here, but like English reads left to right. And so you know, me being a native English speaker uh, and a lot of people, I guess the folks that determine this terminology, uh, the concept is like things start at the left side of the process and work their way through to the right, right? And a big challenge with application security, uh, you know, before DevOps and, and all of this is it was done all the way to the right. Or if you think of the waterfall software development model, you start on the left with requirements, architecture, design, coding, stabilization, release, right? And all of the uh, all of the security testing was at the end, right? So you do this big long development cycle and then security would come in and say, we're, we're gonna do a bunch of testing, we're gonna find a bunch of vulnerabilities and now you've gotta make the decision, do I release this code with known vulnerabilities or do I hold up the release? Both of those are unattractive. And so the concept of shift left is, how do I shift this detection of these vulnerabilities to the left side of the process? How do I move earlier into the process? And that is especially attractive, again, as organizations have moved to agile development methodologies and have subsequently moved to more of a DevOps type of a culture, breaking down those barriers between the development and operations teams. Um, you know, how do I move this detection earlier in the process so that we're running scanning earlier, so that we may be you know, doing threat modeling earlier to identify controls that need to be in place. And so that's the concept of shift left, is what sort of security testing can we move to the left uh, or earlier in the process so that we find vulnerabilities that we find problems when we still have the ability to react to and address those problems before we either have to hold up a release or release software that we know is uh, is, is has known vulnerabilities in it. 
And there's also this concept of shifting right uh, you know, while you're shifting left, which is, okay, well, what, what do we need to do from an operational standpoint? What insights can we only get in an operational environment that we didn't know earlier? Uh, but again, a lot of the discussion here is about the uh, you know, shifting left. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, so, um, excellent. So talking about uh, uh, gamifying for security advocates, uh, which is really cool. Uh, program challenges people with security accounts requests. Uh, okay, yeah, so I'll just, I'll just read this here. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, this is, uh, we've actually gamified security advocate uh, concept, we, what we would call security champions, security advocates, possibly even a better, <laughs> a better terminology for that. Uh, and have been delivering a program that challenges people on security competencies through quests that are applied directly to their application. Some of the security competencies are the novice level, uh, threat modeling, secure coding, and secure, uh, security automation. So that's really cool. Uh, and that's something that we've, uh, you know, again, if, if folks want to look at that security champions webinar, um, uh, that is a, uh, yeah, that goes through different approaches and that's really cool that they've put that structure in place. So it's not just like, uh, you know, at a low level of maturity, your security champion program might be like, well, we sent that person to two days worth of training. So like everybody just asked that person the security questions. I, that, Maybe better than nothing, but depending on how you allow for time management, that actually might cause more trouble than it's worth. But the fact that they've put a structure in place to say, we have like, hey, here's what a security advocate needs to do. We're gonna give you quests or specific activities that you need to do on your application. And we have different levels for that. Uh, putting a structure in place for a security advocate or a security champions program is, is really critical to the success and the longevity of the program. Uh, so that's really cool uh, that, that uh, uh, Joshua, that, that y'all have done that. Um, uh, that's really, really cool to see. And uh, again, if you, if, if you would reach out, um, I'm sure if you, if you haven't already talked to John Dixon, I'm sure John would love to talk to you to learn more about what you've done. Uh, I think that's really interesting. And again, like putting that structure in place to say, it's not just you're the smart security person, but no, here is the list of competencies we expect you to have. Here's how you can advance in that role. Uh, again, making that to be a career path um, is uh, very much of value uh, if you look to scale and uh, again, to push for the longevity of your, of your program. Uh, do we have a mature offering to do AppSec program assessments? Uh, yeah, we do. Um, and, and we do assessments typically with OpenSAM, uh, also looking at BSIM as well. Uh, you know, and, and so if you have an existing program in place, uh, we can come in and help to work with your organization both to yardstick, where are you right now? Um, you know, by look, looking at the different teams and working with them to figure out like, okay, what practices are in place? How mature are those practices? How widespread are those practices? So not just letting you know where you are today, but also helping to create that roadmap to say, you know, here are the areas, you know, looking around the industry, here's areas where you're you know, excelling, here's areas where you're potentially deficient, uh, given your risk profile. Uh, let's create a roadmap so that you can say, well, in this quarter, here's what we're trying to roll out. The next quarter, we're trying to expand that program by 50% beyond and whatnot. And so, uh, yeah, and, and uh, if, if you're interested in talking more about that, just uh, you know, again, I think I, the link is earlier in the in the deck. It's just www.denigroup.com slash contact, I think. Uh, you know, submit the form, reference the uh, reference what you're looking for and potentially the webinar and, uh, and we'll get uh, we'll get in touch. We'd love to talk to you more about that. Uh, those are really fun. Those are really fun engagements for us um, just because they're not, I mean, uh, you know, and again, we've got the testers love doing the testing stuff, but it's also a lot of fun just to get into organizations to understand the dynamics in their organization to see what have they been successful doing and why, what have, where have they felt challenges and why, you know, for us to draw on our experience. Well, you know, in other organizations like you that had this challenge, like this technique, maybe open things up. We'd love to talk more more, love to talk more about that. Uh, let's see, uh, starting left and focusing on the training and education of developers, uh, where shifting left of the process is, uh, yeah, use it as you know, to get that integrated in the CICD pipeline. Um, yeah, and I think that that is, you know, in, in some organizations, that is very, that is really valuable, right? In certain organizations where they've said, like, hey, you know, we're, you know we, we place a tremendous value on our people, right? And so we're going to start by saying, here's why this is important, and we're going to train you all on how to do this and let that work its way through the process. And I love working with organizations like that. And it's not to say other organizations don't value their people, but where they take a very people-centric view, saying these are our best resources, let's make them the smartest, best resources that we have have and let that play out. Um, great. Other organizations uh, you know, with, with, with different cultures, different regulatory environments, uh, you know, it may, you know, that may be a situation where you've got to start right and shift left, where you say, we're going to go in and look, we're going to blow up a couple of applications to demonstrate that this is a problem. 
And that's gonna justify saying, okay, well, let's start to get some testing in place. Now we've got some data about where vulnerabilities are being introduced. Now we can shift left a little further to catch these at the end of sprints. Now we can move further left to catch these in, in whatever. And so that's great that in, in your organization that, uh, that the training has been an effective way to essentially like start here and like work its way through the waterfall or you know, trickle down security. Um, it's great to see organizations like that. Again, other organizations have different dynamics, and that's and that's that's fine. That's you know, that's, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I think the important thing is to understand in your organization uh, with what they value and what they prioritize and what the drivers of decision making are. Um, it, it's it's important to understand what drives decisions because then you can uh, you work at the layer the layer eight of security, which I think is the politics layer. Uh, if I'm, I'm cribbing Wendy Nather. Um, of, the, of the OSI model, layer eight is organizational politics. If you know how to uh, ride those wins, uh, that can uh, you know, uh, that, that can really help in driving uh, adoption. Uh, can threat modeling ever be automated? Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, and, I, and I think some other folks are doing this, we've built some 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 agent based stuff that auto draws threat models, um, which is cool. Um, that, that we're working with. And so I think that there are aspects of threat modeling, at least to get a, um, you know, to get a sketch of what your threat model looks like. I think that this is very popular, or I think it's very possible to automate that. Um, you know, the tweaking of the threat models is something that's always going to require, uh, I, I think, humans. Uh, but I do think that there is an opportunity to automate the generation uh, in a lot of cases of at least portions of a threat model to give a starting point. Um, yeah, and again, uh, even outside of the automation, I mentioned a couple of vendors that are out there that are providing tooling support for threat modeling that can help you to, uh, you know, feed in some inputs like to describe your application and then they can say like, oh, okay, well, here's a candidate threat model. Yeah, use this and iterate or move off of that as appropriate. Um, and so, um, you know, fully automation, eh, probably not. More automation, certainly I think there are uh, some, some both like cool whiz bang techie stuff that can be done as well as just some like templating stuff that can be done that can help folks that are looking to scale their program. We're working with a couple organizations right now to roll out some of those products. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and that's and that's been good. Like we, we had to really rebuild, you know, when in the environment of like cloud native applications over the past couple of years, we've had to rebuild our threat modeling methodology uh, just because the world got more complicated and we, and, and, and but people may need to move faster. Uh, and so it's good to see some tool support that's helping organizations get the scale in the program. Because again, when we look at shifting even farther left, if you can anticipate controls that you're going to need or problems that you might introduce with your threat model and fix those earlier, you can save yourself literally millions of dollars. Like we've, we've found vulnerabilities that cost millions of dollars to fix that could have been found by a like whiteboard threat model very early on. Uh, and so threat modeling, moving that earlier in the process is really, really valuable as a practice. Um, let's see. Oh, good. Uh, they're, they're getting uh, digital badges in that uh, gamified uh, security advocates program. That's fantastic. Uh, uh, so uh, full grade SaaS shouldn't be included in pipelines. Uh, would they run in parallel in the deployment, uh, run those parallel in deployment uh, pipelines? Yeah. And so that is, uh, th that's, a, that's a great point. And so uh, I had a slide back there talking about like uh, you know, CICD testing policies and looking at synchronous activities and asynchronous activities. And a synchronous activity is one where you're going to undertake that activity and you're going to wait for it to finish so that you can potentially make a decision and weigh in on that, right? To say, I saw the result of this testing tool and yes, the build can continue or no, the build can't, right? There's also this concept uh, in, in that slide of asynchronous activities. And those are ones that you might kick off as part of a build step, but those are going to run separately, right? And that's, and that's what we recommend as well to say, you know, hey, are we gonna do this in a nightly build? Are we gonna do this in a per, uh, per sprint build or something like that to say, cool, when this build activity runs, uh, we're gonna kick off our you know, XYZ uh, static scan, uh, whatever that might be. Uh, we're not gonna wait, you know, we're, we're just gonna move on and do the other stuff that we need to do. <clears throat> and that then gets handled out of van. Um, and again, I would love a world where we could do like all the full static analysis and magic pen testing all within a pipeline. It's just not realistic. Uh, it's just not realistic in the size and complexity of applications and, and the run times for these things. Uh, but uh, so you certainly can automate the kicking off of these scans. You just need to make sure that you've got the appropriate business process in place to catch the results of that and then make decisions afterward to say, hey, have we caught this before it went in production? Okay, cool, well now we need to make a decision. Do we wanna hold up putting that in production or not? Uh, or, hey, we know that this is in production, we've identified vulnerabilities that we need to fix. Well, cool, put that in the, you know, the, the backlog in the next build that is going out. <clears throat> 
Uh, and so that's typically the way that we look at handling those like longer static uh, runs that take a long time or dynamic runs that take a long time. Let's handle those out of band, not make the developers wait before they figure out, well, can I check in this code? Uh, but instead make sure that we've got a policy in place or we've got a business process in place that's gonna catch the results of that uh, and, uh, and, and run it through. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, next question is security champion, a training program. Uh, and so uh, training is certainly an aspect of that program. And so, uh, you know, and, and again, I'll reference folks uh, to, to the webinar to get deeper into the topic. But the idea behind security champions is that you either identify folks on your dev team and deputize them to say, you're a security champion. And so you're going to uh, have a budget of time allocated to you and people can come to you for answers about security uh, questions or concerns, and you can either answer those or call back to people with even deeper expertise to reply to that, you know, or other security champions programs layer so-called security champions in across dev teams. But the idea is how do we make sure that each dev team has access to certain security uh, activities? And so training is an important aspect of that, especially if you are deputizing existing development team members. They may be people who have an interest in security, either just they have an interest in it or they are that they view that as an attractive career path. Uh, those people are typically going to need to be trained to have uh, some you know, to, to gain security expertise so that they can act as a resource for their team members. If you're bringing in uh, security champions as an overlay, uh, you know, those may be people that you hire specifically because of their level of expertise that they're bringing in. Uh, or again, they could be internal hires that you, are, that, that you train yourself. And so, uh, but, but training of the security champions is typically an important part of that program when you are, um, uh, you know, when you're, when you're deputizing developers that don't necessarily have security expertise already. Uh, and an activity that security champions often undertake is to mentor or provide localized training for dev teams on security as appropriate. Uh, excellent. Very good. Uh, excellent. And uh, a couple other comments there. Um, uh, the, dealing with uh, internal thread fix stuff and, and, and whatnot uh, and security champion stuff, but uh, talking about like, uh, yeah, open source ideas about uh, their security champion stuff. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll reach out individually uh, rather than talking about that in, in public, but I'll reach out individually on that. Um, good. Well, any other questions? Uh, this has been, uh, we've been going for a little, a little longer than, than usual, but again, I always, um, uh, we've covered, I think, a lot of ground and hopefully we had a lot of great questions. Uh, hopefully this has been valuable for you all. Um, Good. good. Um, excellent. Well, thank you all for everybody who attended today uh, or folks who are watching this in the recording. I uh, really appreciate people coming with their questions, sharing their experience and their uh, advice. Uh, as I said, this uh, the, the deck and the recording will be available uh, if this is valuable or interesting to share to your colleagues. Uh, again, it's a crazy time in the world right now. Uh, so appreciate, uh, appreciate people coming in. Uh, hope everybody out there in, and their families are staying safe and healthy. Encourage everyone to please continue to do so and uh, stay safe out there. Y'all take care. <laughs>